And on behalf of the entire Pete and my team, it's my pleasure to welcome you back for yet another fun-filled episode of the Pete and my Take 20. As a reminder, the Pete and my Take 20 is a quick hitting roundtable discussion led by industry experts on trending topics all in 20 minutes or less. And today we'll be continuing our Back To series by talking about back to agencies and media. However, before we get started, please allow me to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you'd like to ask a question and we encourage you to do so, please use the questions tab located in your control panel. Please know you're welcome to ask questions throughout today's conversation, but we will hold all answers to the end of today's discussion. Alrighty, folks, with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. He's so talented, he can do wheelies on a unicycle. He's the fearless Chris Foster. Chris is the vice president of new business at Modern Postcard, a direct marketing agency located in Carlsbad, California. In addition to his day job, Chris teaches brand strategies at UCSD Extension Courses, and he happens to be the chairperson at the PDMI's Brand Response Council. As always, Chris, it's a pleasure to have you here today with us. Thanks so much, and take it away, my friend. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks, guys, for being on the panel. Really excited about this. Um, talking about back to agencies and media, and also looking ahead to 2022. Just to start things off, uh, very few businesses have their fingers on the pulse of consumers and viewers better than agencies and media companies. Their role is to work with their brand clients and discover what customers want and how to connect programs and content with the brands who want to be in front of those customers, right? So now that life is getting back to a semblance of normalcy, but we're diving in today to see how media companies and agencies are adapting to link brands and consumers in a post-COVID economy and what that actually looks like. we got some questions that we're going to jump into. So I think I'm going to get started with one question first, fellas, and uh, we'll just go around the horn. Ron, we can start with you and then move to Kevin and Sean. So we know that buying patterns have changed. We know that new devices are coming up. Ron, I will ask you. Um, in terms of the psychographics or behaviors that have changed buying patterns, what's the major one that you've seen that your agency has had to adapt to when um, working with your clients and advising them? Yeah, and I would just say that, you know, increase across the board, I think, you know, from a lot of points is, is almost like a 35% surge across, you know, kind of digital um, as far as how people are, you know, they move from retail and, and brick and mortar to online. And that's, you know, affected in a bunch of different ways in the sense of, you know, some of it's been just a boon for companies and, you know, because they've got more than they can handle. We've had folks pull back on things like media because they have too many qualified leads. Uh, we have folks in the housing sector who have had, you know, some of those issues where they have low inventory, they have too many leads. Uh, we've had other folks who, you know, now that they've got so many people purchasing online and doing all these things online, that customer support is now where they have to spend all their dollars and make sure they're meeting the demands for all of that. Um, so yeah, just kind of all over the board, you know, as far as behavior, I think, you know, one of the more interesting, one of the interesting things, I don't know if it's most interesting is that QR cards are, are now becoming more ubiquitous, you know, it's a little trip back mm -hmm. to what, you know, 20, 2013 when you, they first came out and it was novelty and, you know, it really took off in, you know, uh, Asia and that it's kind of everywhere there, but now here in the United States has really kind of taken off and people are using that. You're seeing them in ads, you know, of course they're in all the restaurants, but we're starting to see them and, and showing up even in Hulu. So just kind of interesting stuff. I think, you know, even within like a Hulu, even mentioning that behavior where an ad will come up and you have the choice as to which ad you want to view. So just a lot of different behaviors coming in um, that had been changed and, and, and not going back. I love it. That is a fantastic answer. Kevin, off to you. What do you see? Um, well, I think the big thing that we're seeing so far this quarter is it's very tight as far as the traditional inventory goes. And a lot of that has to do with um, a lot of diminishing ratings, and that's creating the need for them to do ADU weight. Plus, you have a lot more advertisers that are back into the marketplace. Uh, you have big categories like the Medicare open enrollment that's eating up a lot of that inventory. And overall, I'd say a lot of our clients, the feedback we're getting is that the um, KPIs are starting to erode. So in other words, the performance isn't as good as it's traditionally been. It's not kind of the layup that it's been. And we do have a lot of clients that uh, have been exploring the OTT and connected space with us because we're trying to integrate the both, both of them together to be able to have the linear side 
and the connected side to work together and really be able to kind of track those results and then reach those consumers wherever we can. So it's it's challenging in a lot of different ways because of inventory uh, constraints and then just the you know sporadic audiences, the segmented audiences. Like how do you how do you reach the people that you need to and and still have the same results that you have? So it's it's kind of a little topsy turvy right now. Interesting. Excellent. Sean, we'll pass it off to you then. How do you uh, think about the various consumer behaviors that are changing some of these buying patterns and how they receive the media? Yeah, I think uh, Ron and Kevin sort of stole my thunder there. So uh. <laughs> All right, we'll start with you on the next question. We are, we, are, we are seeing a movement to some of the QR codes. I don't know if you've seen flow codes, it's sort of a new call it on brand QR um, that have sort of started to, you know, um, get more traction uh, in the upcoming or currently. I think as Kevin mentioned, we are seeing a pull forward from sort of the OTT CTV adoption. Right now, say linear linear ratings right now are around 12% down on a year over year basis. And I think um, that trend will sort of continue. News works right in even years. Uh, not as much in odd years, right? And and I think for sports, for the most part, the World Series was the second sort of lowest, right, viewed World Series, um, I think, on record, uh, which wasn't good. But I think NFL, you know, NBA, I think in terms of live sports, have actually, you know, they're, I think they're running about a 5 to 8% sort of degradation. So um, I think what we're seeing is sort of a movement to OTT sort of pull forward. I think it's an interesting trend to see whether or not, given the supply chain disruption, you're starting to see the retail numbers pull forward. I know that a lot of the big box have already sort of issued their uh, Black Friday sales, you know, as of November the 2nd. So we, we think get in, get early is going to be the trend for this retail season. And then what you'll see is, Kevin, I don't know how you're looking at it, but I we anticipate some of the dollars in terms of opportunistic buying and maybe come back mid-December because of the supply chain. Absolutely. And potentially retail sort of pulling out of the market. If you're Best Buy, why do you need to be in the, you know, in the market if you, you know, have a T-shell? So it's like our general outlook. I, I love that phrase, getting in and getting in early. Um, it's true just as a consumer and as, as an observer, looking at the, um, the Old Navy and the Walmart Christmas ads coming in right after Halloween, right? They didn't even wait for November 1, it seemed. It was like the day after we hit them. And even um, just being a normal shopper, going to Home Depot and or Nordstrom and or Fashion Valley, they really moved everything up from a Christmas perspective in terms of the holiday season, the holiday decorations and the like, and really priming for a holiday right after Halloween. They didn't even, they didn't even want to wait. So that's, that's a really good insight. Um, so, Sean, why don't I start with you with this next question, and we just brought it up um, as, as kind of a tangent to behavior, and that's with the advent of, possible, of TikTok, um, and TikTok um, incorporating and integrating some e-commerce um, attributes. Um, so, one of the things from social media today was noting that some retailers have created a hashtag TikTok made me buy it sections in their stores. And, and Ron, we had talked about integrations with Equid and Shopify, um, perhaps with the TikTok application so that you can promote a brand, have a video, and then buy right there. Sean, I guess we'll start with you this time. Um, that's a new behavior, right? That's a new idea from a transition from a social media platform. It used to be a lip sync platform, then it became super popular in video, and now it's going into e-commerce. How do you see that playing out into 2022? So I was on a panel yesterday around whether consumers, you know, in this sort of, um, you know, this idea that removing the friction, right, removing sort of the friction in the middle step in between transacting can actually happen on your TV. Do, do consumers want the TV in the living room to sort of become, think of it as sort of a glorified monitor where what you have is sort of these interactive ads or, you know, I mean, who's going to really win? I see a scenario where if you think about it with, with sort of Amazon and Google sort of putting listening devices in people's right homes and then Roku coming out with their soundbar, what's really going to happen is that people are going to be able to say, buy it. You know, we're going to have spots that run in a connected TV environment and they're going to say, say, buy it. It will ship it to your house. 
I think that what we're going to see, Chris, right, is a movement to frictionless sort of any friction within the system. I do think Twitter, specifically Twitter and sort of the NFT partnership that Jack has sort of, you know, spun up as something to think through because they are a strife sort of, um, you know, uh, partnership away from really doing some, some, you know, similar things like TikTok. So I think social plus commerce is here to stay. I think how I far that it. is, yeah. Yeah, social plus commerce. I think that's fantastic. The idea of moving all frictions between initial exposure and purchase and making that as easy and seamless as possible. Um, I know that um, in a previous PDMI program, uh, we had talked about uh, shoppable ads um, that NBC Universal was um, also experimenting with. Kevin, I guess I'll pass that on to you. Um, even beyond TikTok, but is, is there other places where you see social and commerce blending together? I mean, just as a consumer myself, if I, you know, I'm obviously getting served ads that I've obviously shown interest in when I'm on uh, uh, Instagram or whatever, and have definitely bought from those. I think when I've seen commercials or a more of addressable kind of ad, if I was watching, say, a YouTube or a Hulu, for some reason, I'm less likely to want to engage with it. Like, for some reason, it's just easier with a little bit more of a passive ad in 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 you know, an Instagram or a Facebook than it would be on a video screen that I'm actually watching a program. So I think there's some differences there. And obviously people have different feelings about that. But I also feel like the ads that I'm getting served on social media and an Instagram or Facebook seem to be much more relevant than what I see on video. So maybe there's some catch up there that's just not happening. Um, but, you know, if there was definitely a product or a service that I was interested in, and as Sean was saying, you had a frictionless kind of buy. Uh, that's mm -hmm. something I would do as a consumer, definitely. Sure. So, so Ron, um, you know, Red Door Interactive, a digital marketing agency. How is your team then advising your clients of experimenting and exploring this idea of social to commerce? Yeah, and you know, it's it's always client by client. Some are a little bit more adverse to kind of switching over and trying. Some have a little bit more of an appetite to be able to kind of adventure out. We generally try to, within our program, set aside a percentage of budget to try new things and bring them on and see how they work out. So using a bit of testing in order to kind of help expand their their, their reach. So that's that's kind of how we, we, we do approach that. Got it. Very cool. Well, it's going to be super exciting to see, I think, what happens in 2022. And, you know, when we have this conversation six months from now, I think a lot of these um, um, ideas and experiments will actually start folding into um, becoming, quote unquote, mainstream or just another advertising channel uh, for some of these brands. Um, we are at 1114 right now, so I've got one question. Um, go jump, jump in, Kevin. Oh, I was just going to mention one other thing. I think a lot of it also is going to be cpm uh driven you know for a particular advertiser like hey it's great it's a shoppable ad it's an addressable ad but is it efficient is it going to be more cost prohibitive to do it you know so i think a lot of that has to because a lot of the advertisers we're dealing with are all looking at efficiency and like the most cost efficient cost per lead how right. how efficient is that going to be? You know what I mean? If it's it's a high cost, then it may not be worth it for them to, to do it. So a lot of it's cost driven as well. Absolutely. No, that that's a great point. Um, so uh, it's rounding up. We got one more and we, we wouldn't be able to, I think, be fair if we didn't mention some of the, the upfronts um, that that came out. and. And um, I was just reading an article in Variety uh, estimated that NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, and the CW secured between 8.2 and 10.1 billion for their 2021 and 2022 primetime schedules. Um, and uh, Rita Farrow, who's the head of Disney advertising sales, mentioned that um, creating the biggest unique opportunities for each of our clients around customized ad solutions. Um, I guess, Sean, we'll start with you again, if you don't mind. Um, what did you hear from uh, the, the upfronts that are happening and, and as you move into the next you know, buying season, what, what kind of sense do you have or what type of um, insights uh, were you able to pull out? Yeah, well, I think um, CPMs are up, right? I think they reported you know, somewhere between, I don't know, double digit, depending on the network. 
12, 14 percent up. Um, I, I think that the CTD and, and in some cases the major networks were requiring people to purchase in an upfront environment at least 30 percent of the media and CTD. And I, and I think for the most part, marketers wanted that. I think CTD has sort of become the new prime. If you think about how you may consume media specifically, you know, you pay a $70 CPM on prime for network in the voice, or you pay a $35, you know, CPM, the voice on a, on a CTD. So that may make sense. I do think mm -hmm. the battle of the libraries, I, I was looking at some, some data earlier, you know, Netflix has about 40,000 hours of content Amazon Prime has 50,000 hours of content. Discovery Plus is 55,000 shows, but Disney Plus has 4,500 hours of content. If you think about that, 4,500, they're a tenth of size of the content library of Netflix. But you're talking about an wow. where connected TV has caused 300,000 hours of content on top of 500 new scripted shows a year across major advertisers. I mean, it is an incredibly the consumer has more options as possible, and then then their advertisers ask, "Why is it so soft on linear TV?" I used to get, you know, MER, you know, back in the day, we used to get MERs one, two, five, um, and it's just not that way anymore. And I think um, we have to diversify our media mix, right, and move into, as Rod said, to sort of reach vehicles and have sort of a proper expectation, I think, on the ROI of our channels. Um, but it's a it's a consumer's world right now, and so you have to sort of think through platform agnostic wherever media is consumed right wherever media is consumed is where we are targeting the consumer um, and i think if we take a platform agnostic approach whether that's podcasting or pandora video or right mobile TikTok, you know i, I think that's kind of the new role if I could jump in there, I think one of the interesting things that all of this, you know, connected TV streaming has really brought is a little bit of a level playing field for brands, right? You don't just have to be one of the big dogs in order to get your brand on TV and get it in front of it. That doesn't mean you're going to be competing for Super Bowl ads with the like of Doritos, but you're you're you can get on TV, and I think that's been a boon for smaller, scrappier brands. You know, it's interesting. I love that idea, Ron, because um, one of the things that happened with the advent of um, ease, more easily developed e-commerce uh, website platforms is that it started to be, become an equalizer, right? You didn't know if the brand had 25 people or 2,500 people, if they had great photos and a really cool product and a nice user experience and super messaging and the e-commerce work, of course I could compete. Um, so that's actually really interesting to see how marketing and advertising and media uh, becomes more democratized so that smaller mid-sized brands if they've got a great story and compelling characters and a really good product reach your brands as well um, in terms of uh, finding that niche audience especially if you were talking about you know consumers now have the key right they're platform agnostic they're going to find the niche areas that they want to find and they want to find the products they want to find it's the great opportunity for a brand with a niche product to find their niche audience on the platform or the device where those consumers are kevin do you want to wrap it up and take it home um yeah i mean it's exactly what sean said as far as you know kind of a little bit of the depth of uh prime prime time in, in the traditional kind of broadcast stations, there's, you know, uh, a, a, a very sm smaller amount of impressions out there to be able to have, to get, how do you get that same audience to still make an impact? And a lot of the, the those traditional kind of shows that used to be on prime time are now on platforms that there's not even ads on. So it could be a Netflix or an HBO uh, Max or, or wherever, where there's actually not even being seen ads. And even on um, other streaming platforms that do have ads, the ad load is a lot smaller. So it's going to be interesting to see how everything kind of nets out because even though there's more opportunities, it's just like how do you efficiently kind of get those impressions that you need to be able to reach your audience to be successful. So it's going to be interesting to see how it kind of plays out. Well, that is excellent. We won't. Um, that's terrific stuff, you guys. I really appreciate it. We are at 1121 plus. Uh, Johnny, do we have some questions from the audience? 
We do. We've got some great questions. Let me throw some of them at you guys, starting with this one. As you look ahead to 2022, what do you think the greatest challenge for agencies during the year will be? I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll take it. I mean, right now, you know, our ad ops people, I, I, I think that the cookie-less environment and the IDFA, right, environment is just going to cause a softening around social platforms. Um, and I think that, you know, true DR marketers, performance marketing shops, I have to sort of prove out each dollar spent on marketing. I think it's going to be a major, uh, major headwind as we, as we get in. We're going to figure out a way sort of around it, like we always have. Um, so it may be QR, it may go back to phone, microsites. But I think this idea of the honeymoon period that we had in sort of a cookie, cookie world, you know, uh, or a pixel world, um, is going is is we're just going to have to sort of rethink our privacy policy relative to attribution. So at least in my firm, our shop at the Boss Edge is we're we're really looking at around tightening our attribution and, and sort of all the contingency plans around what will emerge. You know. Yeah, I, I can completely support that. Data privacy is driving a lot of these things kind of going on right now, and you know whether that's being able to track ads. Um, but I think you know what's really being coming in focused and what I talk about a lot to clients is in reviewing their marketing technology stack is the uh, CDP or uh, customer data platform and being able to kind of own your audiences for too long. We've kind of given that power to the big social platforms, Google, uh, Facebook, and having them own those audiences, but being able to kind of remove the middleman. We also see the manufacturers moving D to C, cutting out some of the retailers. Retailers are super impacted, but being able to kind of own your audience, speak them directly, and then that's where your conversations, that's where you're tracking, because you've given the permission, you have the trust, you're respecting their data privacy. That's that's where things are moving, and, and you know, brands have about a two-year window to get those things in place. Great. Good answers, guys. Good answers. Here's another question for you I'd like to throw your way. Many social outlets are launching or have launched live shopping that is in a very familiar old school kind of way, but on the mobile phone. What opportunities do you see DTC marketers have uh, to get involved with this process? And how do you think it will grow in the years to come? I think we kind of, you know, leaned in this a little bit. We talked about kind of friction, frictionless shopping and, you know, the availability of shoppable ads. I think that that is that is where it's going. And I, but I think the overall concept that Sean talked about of frictionless is where the future is and just making sure that that's whatever that form that comes in. There's still things that we don't understand that are coming at us. But frictionless, I think, is a, is a real key point there. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Anyone else want to jump in on that? I'm not that familiar with, with that trend, so I, I wouldn't want to comment. No worries. So here's another good question for you. It's a little long, so bear with me as I go through this, but it's a two-parter. In the world where attribution is a must and quality creative and content is critical for all advertisers, do you believe the lines between general and direct advertising is disappearing? And if yes, are agencies and media outlets pushing for change to how general and direct time is bought and sold? Well, I think we have a lot of brands, like more well-known brands, brands, especially um, the insurance category, that basically are utilizing DR buying techniques to measure response uh, to their advertising, while at the same time putting their brand out. You know, in a you talk about reach and frequency in a very high frequency type of manner. So that's it's already happening, um, or has been happening for the last number of years, and I can imagine it would be the same as, as we go into the future because each dollar they spend, they want to know, hey, what are we getting from this? You know, what what kind of impact are we having with our marketing dollars? So I think it's going to be important, whether it's a big brand like Coke or smaller up and up and coming like direct to consumer type of brands. Yeah, I, I tend to think, um, you know, our old um, motto for the agency used to be build a brand, build a business, build a business, build a brand in that order and um, I, I think you know i think we used to look at either brand or performance and i think more than ever it's sort of been both the answer is 
It's both, right? And, and I think that um, it's, just, it's a great it's a great question, but we look at it as sort of both. You have to have sort of a holistic view of what your total marketing efforts are doing. Um, at the same time, it's okay to sort of have different jobs for different pieces of media across the funnel. I think what what tends to happen is you know we get sort of running at least our experience with DTC uh, operators, growth operators who are used to sort of squeaking out the ROI. And then when you sort of move up funnel to sort of some of these larger partnerships, right? We want to sponsor, we want to sponsor a game. You know, we, we want to, we want to do a Super Bowl spot. You know, the question then becomes, what is my ROI on that spot specifically? And, and we look at it as you have to look at different job functions, right. different pieces of media. Cause it's not to say don't do an outdoor billboard or don't do a DM drop, right? Or don't, it's everything is not, should not be sort of, um, they're, they're evaluated under the same lens, right? Uh, and it's the same thing with TV. I don't expect my prime spots in the voice to perform like my daytime prices right spot, right? And, and then everything in between. So anyway, I look at it as the best of both worlds. I think the brands that move ahead are, are, are the companies that will do both well. Good response. Thank you, guys. I'm going to jump back in here. Unless, Ron, you want to add to that? I was just going to say, you know, I, I think in, in kind of building on that, it, it's that trust because, you know, here again, data privacy is wielding its head and causing attribution issues across the board. And, you know, as these folks build their brands, build their trust with their audiences, those audiences will realize there's a value exchange for giving up some of their privacy to getting more targeted ads, getting more uh, incentivized offers. All of those things, I think, you know, are impacting. So I don't think that, you know, specific or individual is going away it's it's just evolving yeah and and just to, to put a pin on what sean was talking about i absolutely agree different marketing channels have different jobs right you don't ask different channels to do the job they're not best equipped to do right and so measuring the totality of all those channels um, as a complete quote-unquote brand formance right package um, is probably the way to go um, even though you have to measure attribution in each channel we all know that consumers are consumers and they're fickle and they buy in the moment when they want influenced by a whole lot of other touches um, so I, I think that it's going to be a, a more flexible uh, perspective on branded performance Alrighty, I'm jumping back in here. Guys, what an awesome session. Thank you so much, Sean, Ron, Kevin, and Chris. Great insights today. I learned a lot myself, and I'm sure everyone else did as well. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. Before we close out, I'd like to take a moment to invite you to join us, join us at our next episode of the PMI's Take 20, which will be hosted on Wednesday, December 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll be continuing our Back To series by talking about Back To You, a year in review. Thanks a lot, everyone. Make it a great day, and we'll see you soon.